Clubhouse. Welcome to Decorating the Set, from Hollywood to your home, with your hosts, Beth Kushnick and Caroline Daly. Welcome to Decorating the Set, from Hollywood to your home. I'm excited for another week of great conversation. This week, we're speaking with Tom Whalen, a great friend, a really talented production manager and producer. He was great, and he seems so easy to work with, which made me think, like any job, I'm sure you guys must come across your share of less-than-friendly people. As someone who relies on working collaboratively, like, how in the world do you deal with difficult people on these teams? You must have tips for our listeners. Well, I pride myself on trying not to have difficult people on my crew in my department, but there's usually the the one person who can make your life difficult. And I try to consider what their difficult job is and where it's generating from. And I think the best thing to do is to come to work with a positive attitude. And at this point in my career, we just try to not let it get us upset and get through our day because there's always so much to do, so many fires to put out. Just stick with your priorities and don't let the difficult person win. (laughs) If you had to choose, would you take a difficult person who does great work or a really friendly, wonderful person who just does okay work? You always ask the tough questions, (laughs) Caroline. (laughs) Um, I would, yeah, I would always choose the person who's willing to try their best. I have had both people with very little experience who are are great and people with a lot of experience who can be difficult. Right now, in my general viewpoint of my world, I would always choose the person who just wants to make an authentic effort and not be disruptive to the process. And I would much rather teach them my way of doing things that's always curtain college, what not? Yeah, curtain college and, and all the rest <laughs> of it. That's always served me well. Well, let's talk about this week's guest. We have Tom Whalen. Tom is a unit production manager, and you and he have worked on several projects together, including one that when we were all doing our research, you guys didn't even know you worked together on, which was private parts. That's so wild that like that it could be so big you didn't even realize. Yeah. Um, Scouting and running a location unit is a specific job that requires specific talent. So what about Tom makes him good at this job and what makes him someone that you always prefer to work with? He's incredibly level-headed and logical, and you know that's my bent. So as we found out, we sort of have an aligned vision in terms of what our jobs are and, and how we have to collaborate with so many different kinds of people and different departments. And we sort of both approach the job with a really full overview of what everybody's needs are. Tom, in particular, has to really decipher what everybody's needs are. I serve the production designer and mostly and serve the script and deal with the characters' backstories and the actors. Tom has every department to deal with. I think the fact that he's so capable of doing that in almost a scary calm way... (laughs) He's so even keeled that I think he ultimately gets what he needs to from all his department heads by being that way. He's very thorough and he's very solid, really solid and good at his job. I'm so glad we got a chance to talk with him and our listeners are going to get a chance to listen to this interview. So let's hop right in there. And now our interview with 
Production Manager Tom Whalen. Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. Nice to be here. Thanks. Tom, thank you so much for coming on today. We're going to start with your start. How did you get involved in the business? First starting as a location scout, I realized that we were both on private parts. I, I was looking at your credits and I discovered one that I didn't even know. So all those years <laughs> ago, we were together on private parts. Tell us, does someone go to college to be a location scout or a production manager? What's your your experience and your education background? I was an undergraduate theater student in Ohio. I moved to New York to work in the theater. And then I did that for a little bit. And then I fell in with some young film producers, Tony Mark and Sue Jett, and became their office assistant. And they started to let me work with them as a PA and then as an AD. And then I went to Columbia's graduate film program. I did that and I met some people there. And one of the persons I met there was uh, a woman named Ginger Sledge. And Ginger was the uh, wife of a fellow student, George Sledge, who's also a production manager in AD right now. Yeah. And Ginger had gotten a job doing location managing on a movie called Night in the City. And I was kind of casting about, not knowing what to do. And someone at Columbia said, why don't you go talk to Ginger? She might hire some locations people. And I said, locations? I don't want to do locations. <laughs> but I went down and I met Ginger and she handed me a camera and she said, I made an appointment for, to go scout this empty apartment. Go scout it. Take some panoramas like this folder right here and paste it up and bring it back to me. And I, I did that and I brought it back to her and she hired me as her assistant location manager. And that's how I got started doing locations. I had no idea that I would actually be good at it. I had no idea. And um, it turned out that I, I had a knack for scouting and location managing and that became my trade. So I started on that show, Night in the City with Ginger Sledge, and I just kept doing it. And I kept getting jobs as a location assistant, as a location scout. Um, I worked on some movies, uh, Last Action Hero. I was a location assistant, and I just kind of worked my way up. But what happened was I, I sort of fell into this uh, low-budget indie film world of the, of the 90s. And I became kind of a sought after location manager for indie films at the time. And I did several films with Christine Vachon. I did um, uh, my, well, before Christine, I worked on Living in Oblivion was kind of my first location managing gig. And then uh, I, I started working with Christine. I did uh, a movie called Kids as a location manager. Um, I shot Andy Warhol. I did with Christine. Um, and then I worked with Steve Buscemi on Trees Lounge. So that was kind of my milieu. I was really working in that world. I think the last thing I did in that world was Happiness. And that was with Christine and Ted Hope. Uh, kind of my last indie feature. And then I decided it was time for me to maybe up my game a little bit. So I went to Mike Hausman, who was producing a movie for TBS. And um, Michael gave me a job on that location managing. And that was my first job as a Directors Guild location manager. And I continued on my path, location managing. I, I worked on uh, The Royal Tenenbaums with Wes Anderson. I wow. did a movie called Freedom Land. And I just kept sort of working along my, that way, and I kept looking for opportunities to production manage. And I had some, some near misses. Uh, I had some things that I turned down because I thought they would never see the light of day. And then finally, I got the chance to be an assistant UPM on a low-budget movie that actually Christine Bashan was producing. I finally sort of got my foot in the door in the production managing area. And so that's how that started. I scraped along. I got jobs as I could. I went back and location managed something. I got another job doing assistant production managing. And then I'd say finally my first real production managing job as a, illegitimately on a regular show was on Blue Bloods. And I did the, uh, the pilot of that in the first season. That was my path to being a production manager. So I've been production managing and now producing for probably the last, I'd say, 13, 14 years. So as a production manager, Tom, talk to us a little bit about how you interact with other departments, like especially the set decorator. Well, the great thing about location managing as a training ground for production managing is that you start to work with everybody. 
And as a location manager, I work with the decorator. I work with the art director. I work with the production designer. Uh, I work with the uh, DP. And I work with everybody. Uh, as a location you manager. deal with all our problems <laughs> yeah and <laughs> yes as a location manager you're you're there you're the sort of the point person for everything that needs to be done on a on a location and you're really actually getting a little hand in scheduling and when does the do the set dressers come and do their work so as a production manager you are that umbrella person who is there to help organize budget and prioritize work and oversee it. I've worked with Beth and I've worked with other uh, decorators and decorating specifically is a job that is, uh, it's a very intensive creative process from my view, but it's also a hugely organizational person as well. They have to be not only creative and good, but they also have to really know how to organize. And so my interaction with a decorator's team is to work with the overall view of the decoration as it as it is it is part of production design and to work out a budget that seems to work for the show and then a lot of my work is with the lead man and with the set dressers also i i am very uh involved with what they do and paying attention to their schedule and their budget and then their manpower also so if i'm working with someone really good like beth I can let them go and do their thing. I can let them do their job and be available to help facilitate if necessary, or have to, if I have to step in at some point to make a change, I do that as well. Uh, sometimes it doesn't go smoothly, but usually it does. You, people know what they're doing, and if you let them do what they do, you usually end up with a good result. But that's your management style, I think, across the boards, which is a rare thing, especially these days when budgets and things are more difficult and the business has sort of changed. But I, I think one of the key things that make our working together so positive is that we I really feel like we're aligned on the logic of, you know, what's a priority and what's important. And you have always given myself and, and my department, you really take a deep dive in the understanding of what every job is. And as a production manager, that's just an incredible asset to, you know, have someone who really knows what all your, your issues are. I think that's true. And I think that the production managing job is a great job for a generalist like me. <laughs> I'm I'm curious about a lot of things. And so I ask a lot of questions and then I end up knowing enough to be dangerous, uh, as some people say, <laughs> um, which is um, I do understand it enough that I can ask questions that sometimes people are surprised I'm asking or, or, yeah. they, or they roll their eyes that I'm asking. <laughs> But in spite of everything I've just said, that doesn't mean that I'm not sitting down with the lead man and really hashing out manpower and really like making them cut and making them cut their manpower. And that doesn't mean I don't sit down with Beth and do the same thing. One of the things I love about production managing and producing is that sort of panorama that I have of the production and that's sort of the big picture of it. And being trained as a DGA location manager, uh, I'm very conscious of what the director is trying to accomplish as well. And I try to keep that in mind as I as I do my job. I think our jobs are very similar in a way. A producer once said to me, of all the department heads, you know, as a set decorator, I'm interacting with every department, the actors, the director, the director of photography, the sound department, the grip and electric and locations. And I, after all these years, also pride myself on having an understanding of everyone's issue and more of an overview. And I think that's why we're so aligned when, when we're on a job together. I don't think that comes necessarily for someone out of film school. I think it really takes a lot of time on set to sort of understand the problems of, let's say, a sound mixer and what I can do with a rug to help his problems in a certain location and and things that would just come up over and over again. And eventually you learn to take on everybody's problems, how to creatively hide cable and give the director of photography what he needs. And I sort of like that part of my job to include the collaboration with everyone. 
I think that's interesting you put it that way because a location manager feels the same way as you do. Mm -hmm. uh, that they're working with every department all the time. And often there comes a time when there's a, something that needs to be done that no one's sure about who does it. It usually comes down to locations or the set dressings uh, right. department. And, and, and it usually comes down to one of those two. And it, it's either the lead man or the location manager raises their hand and says, I can do that. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I think you're right, Beth. I think that's something that we do have in common. You know, we've been talking lately about uh, this season about new jobs that were never really a part of a film crew, like our interview with a graphic designer doing screens and things like that. And something that's sort of new in the last, I don't know, maybe five years that's always on the schedule is a logistics meeting. That's something sort of new to our industry. I mean, maybe... It happened just more organically before everyone talked about the logistics of different issues of shooting. And it was never so organized, you know, as to have its own meeting. But now we have production meetings where each department head is there and we go through the script and go through the schedule day by day. But then they have a, a logistics meeting, which I'm usually not a part of, but my lead man is. Tell us what your thoughts are on the logistics. I think it's the most important meeting. I think the production meeting is extremely important, but I think that the logistics meeting is even more important. The space I work in is episodic television, and I think that the logistics meeting is crucially important in episodic television because every six, seven, eight, ten days, you're starting a new episode, and you're starting a new group of locations, and a new set of company moves, and a new assistant director, and a new director is coming in. The first logistics meeting I had was on the pilot, I think, of the Americans, and I hadn't been having them before that as a production manager. But Richard Hughes was the producer, and he said, so when is your logistics meeting going to be? And I said, excuse me? And he said, when are you having your logistics meeting? I said, oh, well, we're going to have that tomorrow afternoon. And of he course. Said, Great. And um, the first one I did, I was kind of like, what am I doing here? I don't know how to do this. But I quickly saw the value of it and I and I quickly incorporated it into my flow as a production manager. And now to me, it's the most important meeting there is. You know, as Beth said, it's like you have the lead man there, you have the rigging department from lighting and grip there, you have the transportation captain there, you have the uh, location department there. And everyone, because logistics are so important and the trucking is so important, you can really be efficient about what you're doing and, and everybody gets, oh, and the, and, and the production office is there also. And, you know, when the equipment is being picked up and when it's being delivered and we know how many trucks that the lead man's going to need on what day. And it's invaluable for, for organizing and for budgeting. I, I don't see how to do it without it. I think some shows do it better than others. Now that I hire production managers, I think I annoy my production managers a little bit because I attend the, I, I as a producer, <laughs> I attend the uh, logistics meeting and I ask questions. So I, I, I can't let that go, I have to say. It's in your DNA. I have to ask both of you guys. There, there's so many personalities that you guys deal with when you have all these different teams coming together to make one big team. How do you guys deal with the different personalities and the time crunches that you guys are under? I know, Tom, uh, Beth has bragged so much to us that you have such a calm management style. Uh, give, give us some tips. Tell us, how do we all keep it together when it's so stressful? I like to give my mom a lot of credit because I'm from a very uh, big family. I have seven brothers and sisters. And my parents ran a very uh, quiet home where people's eccentricities and, and proclivities and whatever were, if not tolerated, but accepted. And um, I like people and I really like what people do. And I admire people who have skill and I try to appreciate what people do. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't people that aren't annoying, <laughs> that, that don't have uh, habits that are or, or ways of working that are just really not nice to the other departments. But 
what I try to do is I try to incorporate whatever their strengths or weaknesses are into the flow of what we're doing. And if I know that someone is good at something, I try to use that. And if I know that they're not good at something or that they do something, it it's detrimental to the show. I try to decrease the amount of work that requires that. It, it, yeah, it's similar to... You know, I have a lead man and an entire crew. Everyone has their strengths and their weaknesses. Like in a crew of 10 set dressers, there's definitely the right guy to hang pictures. And there's definitely the guy who it's just not his bent. And when you find someone like uh, someone who's a great mechanic and someone who's graduated with the highest marks from Curtin College, you know, I, I try to always have specialties, you know, within my crew that everyone does their thing and they enjoy doing it. You know, when there's a bed to be made, you, you get the right set dresser for that who's been doing a hospital corner for his whole life or her whole life um, versus someone who just, you know, has no idea. They might be good at something else. So I, I think it is a lot about managing people and w what they're good at. That being said, and, and I am, am flattered and I appreciate everything you said about me, Beth, but you also don't see me when I'm screaming uh, in my office uh, just to no one. Uh, you don't. Uh, well, you close luckily, the door, uh, Tom. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, luckily, people don't see that. Um, but um, it does happen. And there are times that are just completely frustrating. And that's when I go for a drive. But yeah, I think you're right, Beth. It's like you find you know what people can do well, and you and you promote that. And there's also people who say, hey, I'm always making the bed. Right. Can I can I lay can I lay the carpet this time? And you go, <laughs> yeah, of course you can. And you let you know you let people ex also expand themselves. Right. But you're also Beth. When you say that there are people who are like, hey, let me make the bed. Get out of the way. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Just let me do it. There's also that happens as well. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like you guys have like have to do like a like a job chart. Like you're like you get to be line leader this week, okay? <laughs> Everyone be cool with it. <laughs> oh gosh, well I know neither of you guys really leave your work behind. At the end of the day, I know that you guys carry your jobs with you everywhere. For Beth, I know when she's looking at furniture or fabric or paint, like she is logging this in her mind for future projects. Is that something that you find yourself doing, Tom? Like you're walking around on vacation or you're you're just in a new city are you like logging in like this would be a good location for this certain kind of scene uh, absolutely you got film brain you know it never well, leaves well, you I, yeah i mean i've i've been living in new york since 1980 and i'm still a tourist i still walk around with my camera i still look up at the building so yeah you're right and when i watch something on tv or I, i'm at the movie i often look at the locations and just marvel or I go or, or I'll recognize the location or I'll try to imagine what it was like on that shoot day. But I also really like listening to other people talk about what they do. I mean, I steal a lot from other people. Like if I see another production manager do a certain technique or, or, or do or organize a certain way and I like it and it works for me, I steal it. I've had some mentors over the year who uh, I, I still channel them uh, when I'm doing what I'm doing. So you're right. It, it doesn't ever leave you. I was, um, you know, as our listeners know, I, I grew up in born and bred in Manhattan. And I was talking to my assistant set decorator's son last week who came and spent a day with us on set. And we were talking about how he had never been on the circle line or, you know, to any of the New York City tourist attractions. And I said, I'll take you on a tour of where I've shot every one of my jobs. Every neighborhood, New York has totally become, uh, you know, over 30 years of just, I was in that store and we turned it into a deli. And New York is always <laughs> different for me now because it's just one location after another. Do either of you guys have a favorite location that you feel like you've returned to over and over again? I don't know if I have a favorite location. I mean, I, I, 
not that I've returned to again and again, but there's places that, you know, we've shot that I will always remember, like the, the mansion in the Royal Tenenbaums was mm-hmm. a place that I'll never forget shooting there. And it was a difficult location and a difficult neighborhood, but I'll never forget that process of being there for months, prepping it, dressing it, painting it building, shooting it for weeks and then taking it back apart and restoring it. That that's you know, things like that are things that are indelible. You know, if you get a chance to shoot on a on a rooftop someplace or I guess the thing I loved about I still love about locations. I love I still love location shooting. I love location scouting because you're you know, you're you, one day you're in a penthouse or on a rooftop and the next day you're in a subway tunnel. You know, you're yep. just one day you're, you're in a funeral the home, the next day you're in a prison. You know, it's um, it's quite unusual. Uh, one location I'll never forget is a, a building in Brooklyn that we put a pigeon coop for NYPD Blue on the roof, and we had to get the pigeon coop up on a on a lift, and the view and the pigeons and. You know, it was a New York shoot that that was in every episode practically, but a lot of places are gone. You know, the through the years in the city and have changed, but that was one that was very memorable. Well, that is an awesome segue for for talking about how the business has changed because for both of you guys, I know Beth, we've talked about when we were doing things with pagers and trying to yeah. figure out how to do it without a cell phone and all that stuff. So, Tom, for you, how has the business changed, especially in things like I don't know, maybe getting permission to use different places or clearances? How have things changed over the years in, in your side of the business? You're right. From as far as location shooting goes, it, it's it's much more complex now to get the permits. Um, it's the shooting on location is more layered now, especially in New York. Residents are weary of film crews. They're more savvy. It's gotten so incredibly expensive to shoot. And the other thing that I've noticed about it is that there are so many more layers of management than there used to be, and the crew has gotten bigger the demands on the look of the show it has been like a an arms race for production value in the past 10 or 12 years where every common episodic tv show has to look like a feature film and so that requires professionals that requires people it requires equipment it qu- requires time you know almost every show has as a as a producer a production manager a production supervisor some have assistant production managers it's just gotten very big, and uh, I've just yeah, seen it's not it's run and gun like like we used to yeah. do. <laughs> like when you 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 know you hear about when they made The Godfather in New York, they had two twenty foot trucks with the equipment in it, and that was it. And now Law and Order goes around with three tractor trailers and uh, and and a, and a fleet uh, of campers for the actor. I mean, it's it's really it's gotten it's gotten big. Do you guys have favorite parts of your job that actually keep you fueled every day where you can't wait to get in there to do that one thing that you actually enjoy doing versus maybe the stuff that you just slog through? I I like getting a new script. I like breaking it down. I like working with the ADs on the schedule. I like working with the writers when it, and the directors when it's time to, you know, especially in episodic television where it's time to like combine and and, <laughs> and condense and to make things workable. Those those are the things that I really like to do. I like the beginning process like that as well, conceiving the character's backstory, and then I love that moment of after all my headaches and problems and thinking that it's not going to work in that finely tuned moment when it all starts to come together. And I see it, that it's going to happen. And even after all of these years, every single time I do it, I'm convinced that it's not. And even last week, I said to my crew, God, we did a lot in eight hours, you know, and It is amazing how even with limited manpower, focusing on what we do the best and what we know how to do, it it does all come together. Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a miracle sometimes um, Mm -hmm. when when you see it actually happen. And and if you're in prep for a long time, if, if if it's a project and you you know you spent three months getting it on its feet, and then that first day of shooting when every when the crew is there and the equipment rolls up and they start unloading it. I'm very sentimental. I mean, what I 
What I like about it also is that when you show up in the morning and they're unloading the trucks and everybody knows what to do, you know everything is going well if nobody's looking for you, if your phone's not <laughs> ringing, you know, you know everything. And, and what's amazing to me on the first day of shooting, as long as I've been doing it, is, is that it always happens because the crew knows what they're doing. Well, the world's machine. Yeah. And everybody, even if it's the first day and the crew first day working together, everything comes off that truck and everything gets set up and the first shot happens. And it's, it's, it's great. It's a great feeling. It's up to you guys. Do you have a favorite project, Tom, that you'd like to talk about? There's a, there's a few that have had an impact on me or have taught me a lot, or I remember a lot, but I think the, I think maybe the one that has the most current influence on me is having worked on the show Gotham for five years. It was a show on Fox it was the backstory of Bruce Wayne when he was a boy, and we did 100 episodes of that show, and um, I was fortunate enough to work on all 100 episodes. That project, we did so much with set design and construction. We had two big stages at Steiner Studios. Uh, we shot in wonderful locations. The costume design was, was unbelievable. The cast was unbelievable. We did a lot on that show, visual effects, special effects. And uh, it was formative for me. And I, I had a great, some great mentors on that show. And I think that's really probably currently the most important influence on me. You know, when you get to 100 episodes, like I have as well, you realize how much time of your life and your career that spans. And it's, it's a lot, especially today. When that happened, we used to shoot 22 episodes a season. So you got to 100, it was a struggle, but still it, it happened now with things being six and eight episodes a piece. It's sort of really hard to uh, accomplish that in the business anymore. You're so right, Beth. And I, it, it, going back to the earlier question about how things have changed, I think that's one of the huge things that have changed is the process of making those episodes. I, I spent a year making eight episodes of a show recently. And the, and the year before that, I spent a year making eight episodes where, as Beth said, we used to make 22 a year. So it's certainly a different world. Well, before we let you go, tell us about current projects or the one that you did last year, Daria from Detroit. Yeah, that recent project was called Diara from Detroit. It's for BET Plus. And Diara Kilpatrick is the creator of the show. She's also the star of the show and she's the writer of the show and executive producer of the show. And she did an amazing job, an incredible woman. And the show is fantastic. It starts on March 21st on BET+. Plus. They're going to do, drop the first three episodes and then one per week for the next five weeks. And I think it's great. It's a really ambitious show for BET. It's like nothing they've done, I don't think. And we did it on a pretty limited budget and a limited schedule. But I think it's really great. And I'm very proud of it. So exciting. You're credited as line producer on Diara from Detroit. What does the line producer do? The line producer works between the production manager and the showrunners and the studio. My job is to take these scripts and work with the, the writers to mold it into a season of shows and to do the overall budget for the season, to hire with the showrunners and the writers the key creative people, and then have a product, work with the production manager to execute the plan and to hire the crew. So that's a job I really like. Um, I did that on DR from Detroit. I've, I started doing it on Gotham, actually. With Gotham, I started as the production manager and ended my career on Gotham as a line producer. So, yeah, I'd like to keep doing that if I can. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. We're, we're so, so, so happy to get to talk to you and get to learn more about the different parts of the team that make up this gigantic industry. I know a lot of our listeners are wanting to bust into the industry and trying to figure out what jobs would work for them. So this gives them a little bit of an idea of what to expect out of, out of a producing job like this that you do. Beth, thank you so much for bringing on Tom. We are so lucky that you have such wonderful friends and listeners. Make sure you check out Diaria from Detroit, streaming on BET Plus beginning March 21st. And thanks so much for listening, you guys. Thanks a lot. It was a lot of fun. Big thank you to Tom for making time to speak with us and tell us about his history in the business. 
Listeners, please make sure you check out the new show that Tom worked on, Diara from Detroit, streaming on BET Plus beginning March 21st. And that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you all for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to Decorating the Set from Hollywood to Your Home at Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Please leave a five-star rating. It helps us in the promotion of the show. Five stars, people. Decorating the set from Hollywood to your home is an original Pod Clubhouse production. Recorded, edited, and produced at Pod Clubhouse Studios. For more information, please visit us online at podclubhouse.com. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to Decorating the Set at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening.